All right, my name is Andrew Thompson, and this is the seven principles for making a Postgres QL database work fast. Because this is a lightning talk, we are going to be averaging about one slide, uh, at one principle per minute, so we got to get going here. All right, so, so starting off, principle number one, good relations begin with truth. What I'm saying here is that that means that if you want to scale, troubleshoot, maintain your database fast, you can't be tripping over leaky, bad data abstractions. <laughs> so you really need your data model to be based on the physical, the logical, the business process that your data application, that your actually represents. Not just technical abstractions that are done for convenience as they come up through the software development process, but it needs to be grounded in reality. And I'm not saying that you need to discover the the uh, mythical sixth form of database normalization as you're building out your database schema, but it needs to be realistic and based on the, the context of what you're building. Just as an example here, we've got uh, Carolina Code Dogs web front here. This is more or less how it should be. Like the process of ordering a hot dog online, the customer's placing orders, that order has lines that go to menu items, you know, and that's how it should be. What you don't want to see is tables that are just created for convenience reasons, like tied to UI abstractions, uh, not normalizing for convenience, because that's going to be painful to unpack performance-wise. Principle number two, learning to smell trouble, or profiling and finding problems before they bite you on your application. Now, this is a big subject that you could do a talk on. There are books written on this subject. Um, but I'm just going to talk about in Postgres land, there's really two tools that I think should be used be in your back pocket on like production and development databases. And those are PG stat statements and auto explain. These are both extensions that run on your Postgres server. And so they will need to be loaded, configured, uh, turned on. But once they are running, PG stat statements creates a new table that you can query with SQL. And you can find out about how fast your queries are running which ones are thrashing disk, causing I.O. problems, or have really slow and fast execution times. So this is very helpful. Auto explain, it's kind of in the name. If you've ever used an explain statement to get the query plan for one of your queries, auto explain does it automatically. Whenever a query crosses a execution time threshold that you set, what you consider to be slow, it will log out that query plan so you can see what was going wrong at the time it happened. If you're using a managed Postgres um, provider, they often will take these two tools and turn them into pretty visualizations so you can see over time all the mistakes that you're making. Principle number three. So right here, we are talking about how to decide how much data processing you should do on your database server versus on your back end and then doing round trips to get more data. And this is one of those things where um, you know, the answer is it depends. So I'm going to give you left and right bounds and help you decide where to fall on that spectrum. Um, just as a reminder, stored procedures are callable functions that live on a database that can chain together queries, common table expressions, logical, recursion. Like, it can do a lot on the database because SQL is a pretty, pretty uh, complex language. So I think the two sides of the spectrum here are don't join me, bro, which is like, you don't want the database to do anything. You're just doing single table queries, parsing out the foreign keys on your back end, and then doing another query. The other end of the spectrum is you could do your entire application in SQL. You can write all your logic there and just make your back end a thin abstraction that just calls these sprocks. Both of those are very bad ideas. So to help you decide where you want to fall on that line, I think there's really five factors you, can, you should consider. There's the developer SQL fluency. So even if you have this god mode sprock that does this critical function, but there's only one developer on your team that can understand it and fix it, when it breaks, that's probably not a good idea because you have a single point of failure tied to a limited development resource. Also, if you have slow network latency between your, your back end and your database, um, you might want to get more done per call, and so Sprox is a better option. Um, similarly, how you're hosting it. If you're self-hosting, if it's on a managed platform, how much flexibility you have to be able to scale up when load gets heavy. If you are inflexible, doing a lot of work on the database is probably a bad idea. And then finally, um, do you really need all that speed of data operations that the database can provide? Or is it something that's more of an async load that can be done on the back end without bogging down your database? Principle four. So when we talked about profiling, you're going to surface um, 
slow queries that might be able to be fixed by just writing better SQL. But oftentimes, you will need to write an index, which is sort of like a table of contexts, to help the storage engine grab the data faster. Um, this is also a very broad subject that there are many books written on. So I'm just going to give you a couple tips on deciding uh, whether or not you should start peppering all your tables with a ton of indexes. And the first one is just you really should understand the use case, not just the slow query, but how is this being used? Is this blocking UI? Are there related queries that are looking for the same types of information? What's the sequencing of it? Because that's going to help you craft a smart query. Similarly, before you just start writing them and you know, committing them to prod, understand the mechanism of how those indexes work, especially multi-column indexes, and whether or not the uh, storage and the query planner is going to use them is really important. I would recommend a book by Tobias Petrie called Indexing Beyond the Basics. This is a good just like short crash course that can kind of get you up and running on writing your own. And then finally, every index is actually going to uh, slow your, your database down ever so slightly. And so large indexes and too many ind indexes you may have been doing it for the right reasons, but you can actually affect performance by going overboard. So just as a, uh, a quick uh, quiz here, if we have this table here, which of these three indexing patterns would be the correct way to do it? it you don't know. It doesn't matter. The only thing we do know here is that Barry Jones loves B Visual Basic. <laughs> um, so principle five. So eventually, you're going to find that that server is getting crushed by traffic, and it feels like it can't do it on its own. So what do we do? I believe that the first thing you should do is just buy a bigger box if you can. Scale up that primary instance as long as you can, but eventually you may be constrained by both the uh, I.O. and the connections that can be pooled on that one server. So you have some options past that. The first one is replication. This is, if you have a high reload, this is usually the way to go, because you're going to be taking the, uh, uh, basically copying your database with read-only instances that are synced to the primary write. And then you can just modify your client code to pull off those read instances, freeing up the write instance to, to be more performant. Now, if you have write-heavy and it is a, a kind of crazy high amount of traffic or multi-tenant, sharding is another technique where we are actually splitting the database with these same tables across multiple instances. And this is done, there's different ways, row-based or schema-based to do it, but it's accomplished with some like wild hashing logic and lookup tables and usually a proxy middleman called the coordinator that traffic cops the SQL queries to the right instance. This is a pretty complex process, but it can really improve performance and help for special use cases. Principle six is, you know, it's quitting the relational game when, uh, when it becomes necessary. And they always say that when you're a CRUD app, you either die of performance issues or live long enough to become a columnar reporting tool. And that's kind of what this is about, is uh, when you have, but you need to know what tool to pick up when heavy performance is hurting you. So if it's just a single uh, expensive computation and it doesn't change a lot and it's related to the entity, just add a column, not a big deal. However, if you are stitching together queries from multiple entities, they're not necessarily related to any one of those specifically, um, then you might want to create a new table that is just for these reporting values. And if the consistency is really important, then a materialized view can help you in the same situation. Uh, finally, if your product has gotten big enough, the product owners are probably going to hire a bunch of data scientists who will write terrible, terrible queries, full table scans that will slow down your database. And the only thing you can do is bail out to an extract transform load pipeline that eventually dumps into a columnar database or some sort of OLAP tool. Now, this is a huge jump in complexity, but it really pays for itself, especially if the business value of, of fast analytics is going to help the product. And the final principle is using the right tools. So the, one of the main tools you have is where you're going to host this database. Um, you can always self-host Postgres on bare metal, Docker, Kubernetes. But for many uh, small to medium-sized applications, a managed uh, service from one of the big cloud providers is going to take care of a lot of the housework of backups, monitoring, you know, networking, things like that. Um, and they usually have an easy button if you, want to, if you do need to use replication. For more exotic use cases, like uh, distributed compute, uh, serverless, scalable you know, storage, 
Uh, there's Neon and Timescale are two independent companies, but the big cloud providers have their own Postgres co compatible solutions as well. And then finally, for sharding, there is a uh, Citus is the main extension that everyone uses. But if you don't want to run it yourself, uh, Bill Gates Co. is happy to do that for you with Cosmo DB. And then lastly here, um, this is kind of a, this is our last kind of spicy topic. There's a lot of hot takes here. I would say that the two main takeaway here is you just got to know your development team. And you know, so you got to set everyone down, look them all in the beady eyes, and look at their strengths and weaknesses and say, is this ORM going to give us better velocity and better code? Or is it going to enable some foot, foot, foot guns and like anti-patterns that will actually not get caught by our code review process? And so only you can make that determination by looking at the project and your code base to know if it's going to be worth the squeeze. As an aside, I will say that if you are in the TypeScript space and have not tried Drizzle, it is delightful. It's just like the perfect amount of whimsy. And uh, that is it. Those are the seven principles. If you scan this QR code, you can get a link to the slides and uh, check out some of these links and references um, on to learn more about Postgres.